Hello, my name is Hélène Langevin. I am the director, the director of the National uh, Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at the NIH. And it is my pleasure uh, to speak about research on whole person health. So it's no secret that despite having the highest per capita investment in healthcare in the world, the U.S. has alarmingly poor health outcomes and that this situation is getting worse. Health disparities are an important factor contributing to this situation. But another important and largely overlooked problem is our focus on treating diseases separately once they occur, rather than making the upfront investment needed to maintain and restore the health of the whole person. I will use a clinical case study to demonstrate this. Our patient is Mrs. M, a 40-year-old woman with a five-year history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, knee osteoarthritis, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, and gastroesophageal reflux, managed with a total of six medications. Fast forward 40 years. Mrs. M is now 80 years old. Her hypertension and diabetes are still under reasonable control, but her insomnia and chronic knee pain are increasingly problematic. She's not been able to sleep for, without medication for many years. She's had some significant cognitive decline, daytime somnolence, unsteady gait, several falls, and worsening anxiety. She had a gastrointestinal bleed from erosive gastritis in her mid 60s and can no longer take non-steroidals. And she has, had, she has needed stronger analgesic to control her knee pain, including occasional opiates for acute exacerbations. What is wrong with this all too familiar picture? The patient is suffering from having been broken down into body parts. Each problem is treated separately and the resulting polydiagnosis and polypharmacy create an additional layer of iatrogenic drug-induced pathology. Failure to understand the importance of seeing this patient as a whole person has led her to being treated using a fragmented, disease-focused model that encourages a reliance on pharmacological control of separate diseases and conditions rather than restoring health. Now, let's imagine that we can rewind the clock and go back to Mrs. M at age 40 and explore possible connections between organs and systems, as well as across biological, behavioral, social, and environmental domains. Upon further questioning, Mrs. M reports that her difficulty sleeping is exacerbated by a noisy bar across the street and fear that her neighborhood has become increasingly unsafe. She notices that her blood pressure is worse when she has not been sleeping well. Her heartburn bothers her also more when she's under stress at work. She works as a receptionist at an urgent care clinic and has had to work extra shifts due to staff shortages. Her work is mostly sedentary, and although she used to go walking in a nearby park, recent construction made the sidewalk unusable and she stopped going. She feels the lack of exercise due to her knee pain and has contributed to her weight gain. Her diet consists of mainly what she can grab quickly at work or on the drive home. There are no grocery stores selling fresh fruit and vegetables within a convenient distance of her home. After Mrs. M's initial evaluation, she was started on antihypertensive medication and referred to a health coach who instructed her on using an app for cognitive behavior therapy and breathing exercises to help her sleep. She noticed that the abdominal breathing helps her with her heartburn as well. She was referred to physical therapy for her knee pain and was able to increase her walking time using a Fitbit for motivation. She was also referred to a dietitian and a social worker who helped her sign her up for a home food delivery. Her weight stabilized and her hemoglobin A1C began to trend down. Her successful behavior change was facilitated by a personalized approach, starting with what matters most to her, wanting to improve her sleep and gradually incorporating additional elements, physical activity, and diet. 
Importantly, the lifestyle habits and stress management skills that Mrs. M acquired in her 40s will be relevant for the rest of her life and contribute to a healthy aging. Fast forward 40 years, Mrs. M remains physically active and helps take care of her grandchildren. She continues to take a thiazide diuretic to control her blood pressure, and this remains her only medication. Her BMI has been stable at 27. She eats mostly home good foods, and her hemoglobin A1C is in the upper normal range. Her right knee continues to bother her, mainly going up and down stairs, but she describes the pain as manageable. She describes her overall health as good and is satisfied with her life. If we go back to Mrs. M version A and ask ourselves why the pharmacological model has been so strong in the last hundred years, certainly an important part of the answer is that we understand how drugs work. For most drugs, we know what molecule the drug interacts with, along with the biochemical pathways that are being activated. For example, a proton pump inhibitor, such as omeprazole or Prilosec, blocks acid production by the stomach cells, and we know exactly how they do that. In contrast, we know very little about the mechanisms by which uh, breathing can influence acid reflux. The reason for this is that the respiratory and gastrointestinal systems are studied separately by different groups of people, and there's almost no research at the intersection of these two systems. However, it makes perfect sense that the mechanical forces created by the diaphragm during breathing could influence the gastroesophageal junction because it is situated right underneath and is actually connected to the diaphragm by connective tissue. Our biggest challenge is that we need to overcome a tendency to break things down that goes back over a century. Since the beginning, medicine and the biomedical sciences have been organized around specific organs and systems. While our understanding of disease mechanisms since then has become increasingly precise and analytic, going down to cells and molecules, what is lagging behind is synthesis or integration of these mechanisms to understand the whole. We need to move beyond thinking about diseases one organ or system at a time. It's important to realize that even when we recognize diseases as co-occurring in, in one individual, we still think of them and treat them as separate. We are making great progress in systems biology and are starting to understand human health in terms of interconnected multi-scale networks, and that's good. However, research within these networks tends to be segregate, segregated within scale silos. And we need to do better at bridging across these scales. For example, we do very cool research at the molecular level with omics studies. And at the other end of the spectrum, we are starting to understand how to utilize big data from electronic health records. But transfer, uh, translating across these types of data through the middle layers of these tissues, anatomical structures, and physiology is very challenging. We have successfully done this but it's been one organ or system at a time. What we need is an integration across the full whole person, bringing biological, behavioral, social, and environmental domains together. We are ready to ca tackle this challenge due to the current explosion of knowledge in systems biology, network science, and multi-system modeling. Now imagine that version B of Mrs. M is not only managed as a whole person, but we actually have the integrated knowledge and understanding to support her integrated care as smoothly and efficiently as we understand how to predict and manage the weather. In summary, whole person research will help us move from a compartmentalized disease model to a fully integrative health model that includes health restoration in addition to disease treatment and prevention. Thank you very much for your attention.